Hey, welcome everyone. This is Mark Goring with the CDS Consulting Co-op. I'm joined by uh, Thane Joyel, uh, uh, Joel Brock doing technology. We also have Joel Kapitschke and Ben Sandel from our co-op uh, sitting in. And our goal today is to uh, have a little discussion on uh, making the most of CBuild. And our, um, our focus in this session is going to specifically uh, address a uh, kind of program overview and then two program features, the use of ongoing consulting hours and the uh, retreat that's included in the program. We have another session next week where we're going to focus on uh, our in-person events and some of the new things that we're working on for, for uh, 2017. So thanks for joining. Um, there is a way to do um, audience participation and we would super enjoy your comments and questions to come in uh, during the session. We'll answer them best as we can while we're together. And Joel Brock, I'm going to hand it off to you for a technology lesson on uh, letting us know how people can can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, everybody, feel free to just uh, chime in. in. Feel free to introduce yourself and say hi and what co-op you're from in the comments section on the YouTube page to the right of the live stream here. Uh, and thanks again for joining us. Quick overview of the of the CBuild program. Um, maybe first starts with the CBuild team. We are um, members of the CDS Consulting Co-op. We're all independent consultants, but we work closely together uh, as members of the CBuild team in delivering the services that are included in the CBuild program. And um, uh, kind of nuts and boltsy stuff, which probably many of you know or are aware of, is that we assign one of our team members as what we call and think of as the primary CBuild consultant um, who works closely with, um, with each of the co-ops that's in the program. How we think about ourselves um, in that role is um, as a valued member of your team that uh, we're kind of riding alongside you as you do your work. Um, and specifically, our, um, our relationship is based around the, um, the board and the board GM relationship. So our goal is to be um, uh, helping you, observing, providing feedback um, on the board's work and the board GM relationship as you move through time. And um, we've been uh, using the CBuild program approach for that work since 2005. And uh, one of our takeaways um, over that time is that boards go through cycles of what they're uh, needing to work on and what they're, what they're, you know, how they're focusing their attention and resource. And of course, people come and go on the board, and GMs come and go. And um, and our team member who's you know kind of riding along with with the work um, can really f um, uh, follow those uh, through those cycles if yeah. we're gonna just sort of frame the concept of c build what i was thinking about while you were talking was just remembering how the program evolved um from the pilot which i think was called coco beep right yeah. in mm -hmm. 2004 um, and at the time, I was a board leader and I was sort of mystified why there were uh, people, consultant people, who would take an interest in me as a board leader. Oh, yeah, right. And I've really come to appreciate uh, the value Sybil provides by strengthening the whole co-op. So uh, providing support to the board of directors and to the people who are trying their best to foster a cooperative democracy. I think it's truly compassionate because the truth is that cooperation actually takes a lot of planning and thought and it's just not easy. So huh. that's what I would add. Huh. Nice. Okay. Good. Um, and then just to kind of pop back up to the uh, larger framework of the program and the relationship that we strive for with the client community is that the program has different parts. and. Um, uh, we describe one part as ongoing consulting hours where where our uh, person from our team is is working closely with the client co-op. Uh, another part uh, that we'll talk about today is the, 
the use and value of, of the retreat. And our goal today is to kind of show a range of what that can look like so that, again, just as kind of a creative exercise in, in, um, in, in thinking about, you know, the meaning and value of a retreat. So, um, Thane, let's jump into, um, into ours and um, just, you know, as a program feature and describe kind of the function they, they serve and some ways that we see them being used. So the fundamentals of a co-op are all about relationships, right? So the primary thing we focus on in uh, delivery of services through Seabuilt is uh, in-person uh, and personal connections with people. So support hours are used um, however the co-op wants. We figure 15 hours is a bundle of support that represents enough hours uh, for your primary Seabuilt consultant and whoever your co-op chooses uh, to be most effective to connect with the consultant at any particular time, about once a month. I think for my clients, I budget about an hour or and a quarter call once a month um, with board leaders. And I encourage board leaders to bring one other person to the call. Um, sometimes clients prefer to bring their whole board uh, or to use their consulting hours for, you know, in a whole variety of ways that I think um, I think one of the reasons for having this little time together here today to talk is to share some of those ideas about how to creatively use ongoing support hours. But it is the foundation of the program. Getting in a regular call pattern, you'll often notice your primary Seabuilt consultant doesn't want to hang up the phone until you have a next call scheduled um, because it's really um, maintaining relationship um, on an ongoing basis that provides our ability to best be an effective member of your team. If we don't know what's going on with you, we can't really effectively participate uh, constructively. <laughs> yeah, nice. And what uh, what I would add uh, uh, to that is the ways that we we have that awareness is um, through the calls, the ongoing calls that Thane described. Plus, um, what we really appreciate is getting in your information. Uh, stream so that the information that's going to a director is also going to us. And um, we're not reading it deeply like uh, we would expect directors uh, to do, but we are scanning that information in between our um, calls with you so that we're very familiar. And the, the value of that is that then when we're actually on the phone, we're doing less um, uh, updates you know, this happened and that happened because, you know, we actually know what was in, you know, the last packet or uh, uh, or hopefully were included on email um, listservs and things like that. And so, you know, we're coming to the table, you know, pretty well informed. And then we're able to kind of do the deeper dive into the to the work with you and, and be, you know, parsing stuff out. Um, back to you, Thane. Well, I guess the other thing I'd add is that one of the things we're paying a lot of attention to is the quality of the relationship and the match between the client and consultant. I can remember when I was a Seabuilt client years ago, um, I would have these brilliant ideas and then do all this work, implement these cool programs, and then realize that actually my Seabuilt consultant had been coaching me for a couple of years, uh, mm -hmm. gently seeding ideas that helped me come up with these amazing ideas all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things we're aware of is that each of us have a different consulting style. I think mm -hmm. if, you can see my hands moving while with some of us, you know, are actually soul sculptors. Uh, and we try to be attentive as our board leaders and compositions shift. We're striving for long-term relationships with our co-ops uh, and um, to develop, you know, matches that will be really durable. But we're also sensitive to shifts in human dynamics over time as we try to right. help our team members in and out as needed. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. And then maybe another uh, kind of a dimension to these uh, phone calls that we're on. Uh, what's our role there? And uh, Thane mentioned um, bringing you, the client, bringing more than one person to the call. That's really awesome because then we can um, kind of foster a conversation uh, uh, with you and among you as opposed to it being one to one. Those are handy sometimes if a person is just, you know, trying to sort out some issues and 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 wants you know to just ask a, 
a question for their own benefit. But oftentimes the focus of the work is um, about something that the group is trying to do or that the board and GM are trying to do. And, and having um, you know, the board leader and at least one other person on the call really helps make that conversation come alive. Um, and as I've been reflecting on, um, you know, many of the clubs that I work with, uh, we use uh, the board leader comes, maybe that second board person, and oftentimes uh, the GM is there also. And we're using the agenda as kind of a, a foundation, the agenda for the next meeting. We're saying, okay, well, these are the things we know are coming up. Maybe we'll also be looking at the uh, annual calendar so that we know kind of what the sequence of of topics are for the board meeting, not just the one coming up. So we're, you know, paying attention to those longer range themes. Um, but by having that, you know, the the small group, it's not just, uh, you know, us and one person, which really adds a lot of value, I think, when we're not present, because you're able then to continue the conversation more easily, you know, without us. It's not like, oh, well, Mark said this. It's actually, no, we talked about this on our phone call. Um, so, any, any other uh, hours type stuff? You know, just I think the other reason to have more than one person on the call is because we can uh, get a, get advice and share experience that we know of either through our work with other co-ops or from conversations we've had in our team or training or skills that we bring to our work. But um, the more perspectives we have on a situation in the conversation, the more nuanced and complexified it can be. and uh, the better you know, we hone our advice. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, it doesn't actually serve the co-op at all to uh, have, you know, just one person in the relationship with the CBIL consultant going back and say, well, you know, they say we should do this. Well, you know, who knows, you know, and it's not our co-op, it's your co-op. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Uh, I'm pretty fond of that phrase, uh, if I were in your shoes. <laughs> and because to me, that really helps uh, share that, you know, uh, the client is in the decision making uh, role. We are providing perspective, resources, expertise, uh, maybe storytelling regarding, um, you know, what other co-ops are working on. I can do the deep dive into some project support. But at the end of the day, it really is, you know, how how you, the client, or group of people who are working on behalf of the co-op are able to, you know, sort through the information, ask great questions, make really informed decisions. So I think it's interesting. Uh, we spent a little bit of time on the, like what topics and issues kind of come up in the ongoing consulting hours. And really it's just anything. Um, and it's really like, here are the priorities of the board. Here are issues we're having in group dynamics, here's how we want to elevate the um, uh, level of support provided to the GM. Here's how we're thinking about our member engagement. Here's how we're thinking about our bylaws. I mean, almost anything that the board is working on, we can uh, participate in that conversation with you. And then at some times we might say, hey, uh, I'm going to, um, wh why don't we uh, patch in another person from our co-op who, uh, who is an expert in this. So examples of that would be Carolee Coulter, who we can tap for you know, GM hiring, or Bill Gessner for expansion and growth, or you know, any number of people. And, and that's where we're able to kind of make that bridge on a very kind of uh, in, a, in a focused way, make an introduction, maybe use a C-Build hour to set up a phone call, make something happen um, you know, super efficiently for, for, uh, for the client. So, Thane, uh, anything else? So, so that's sort of, we're talking mostly about baseline hour support, right? Yep. But, mm -hmm. but I think, can we take a few minutes and just talk about creative ways that people use those consulting hours? Because actually, we do way more than just talk on the phone, right? Okay. One of the things I'm thinking about is one little, you know, special item I've done for board members or for boards is working on bylaw projects and revi revising bylaws. I know Michael Healy has a particular genius with um, tinkering with uh, policy register language. Um, 
from time to time, there are a variety of committees will pop up in the course of a board's life that can really benefit from some intense focused uh, attention from a CBIL consultant. Yeah. And we try to pour resources into those committees. Or we actually sometimes show up at board meetings on a speaker phone, right? right? And that's one good way to bring the consultant into the whole conversation of the board. That's right. Mm -hmm. Good. Good mix. Um, so again, maybe that the um, uh, it's kind of on the co-op and the board to be willing to commit to its own development, to be able to name how it's applying itself and its work. And then the burden is on the re us and the relationship to bring the value and make those connections either, you know, through our own, uh, presence in the consulting relationship or tapping any number of other people that we have access to. Um, but again, kind of driven by what's the work? How are you, the client, organizing yourself to do the work? If, you know, how, and how can we um, be associated with that over time? Um, and, you know, maybe for the broad goal of helping you do better work more easily, um, you know, the because of our team culture and our relationship with more than 100 co-ops in this uh, manner, we do have access to how things have been done and what's working well and can share those ideas with you, um, you know, given the opportunity. We can pause for Joel Brock to see um, if there were any hours, questions before we keep okay. cruising. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a couple other consultants who we could even um, rope into just this discussion. Ben Sandell on the line, if Ben wants to chime in just really quick for a minute before we move on and talk about some ways that um, he's he's used the breadth of the CDS Consulting Co-op to help his clients. Um, one of the ways that I try to use, uh, try to help my clients in the Seabuild program is, you know, that we frequently, uh, I will encounter a challenge or a struggle that a co-op is having that another co-op has also had that before. And we may have resources available for that, uh, that I can then do some research, find appropriate resources, maybe even find a recommendation of someone to talk to at another co-op who's already gone through this successfully and use that Part of the, the relationship that I have with both the client who needs the help and other clients who've already experienced this, I can connect them, connect the client to resources. Um, it goes beyond, well beyond uh, just the time we spend on the phone in terms of the, I think, the value that a client, that a co-op can get from that. Um, nice. Yes. So uh, one of the ways that I've used ours is, in fact, I've brought Ben Sandell in. Um, ben is an expert with capital campaigns and uh, has spent a, an hour or two working with one of my boards to uh, initially just better understand capital campaigns. Um, and then beyond that, to help plan um, and implement successful capital campaigns. So we've used some time for that. Um, I've also used time, um, you know, we talked about committee work, one specific committee. Um, that may be, uh, may be happening more and more as we move forward, um, as we have a wave of GMs who are reaching retirement age, is GM hiring committees. And I've used uh, Melanie Reed and, and other consultants from our HR group to help come in and again, just help the board first understand what the process is gonna look like, a timeline, budget, things like that. Um, and then some have, some have used more time to help develop a plan um, and get support all through the process. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, Joel. The coupling of, of ongoing support hours with uh, helping plan and facilitate the in-person retreat is really a powerhouse uh, because we're very familiar with you all and then we participate in the planning process for you know, the, the retreat design. And so it's not like we're just showing up, we don't know you, we know you very well. So we can help um, uh, with suggestions on, 
uh, what we think might be the useful areas to focus on uh, and really be in that conversation with you as you know one of your team members so that's uh, the, those two I think and that these two go back to the uh, the pilot year of 2005 and I think that the value of, of, of them together has just been uh, continually reinforced uh, in my mind so um, I tend to think of a retreat very broadly from a strategic perspective in terms of what should or could happen in a retreat by just uh, thinking of it as an opportunity for the group to get together, use an investment of time and resources to really help move the whole group forward in its work. So it's an opportunity to really refresh the thinking about what are we working on, what do we need to work on, and if we're gonna to get together for um, uh, an extended period of time, what could we do together that would really kind of catapult us forward? That move, advancing your, your ability to, to do great work together, you know, comes in all shapes and sizes. So Thane, how would you um, take that from there? I think one of the most exciting aspects of retreat planning is figuring out who needs to be in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways that the ongoing hours help is your CBIL consultant, I think, gets a sense of what you're working on and how you are working as a group as you go along through the year. So when you plan the retreat, thinking about who needs to be in the room, I've seen boards. Uh, typically, it's typical to include a general manager, but it's increasingly common to see bringing in uh, key members of the management team, um, sometimes board candidates or prospective board members will attend all or a portion of the retreat, a recent retreat, um, a prominent community leader joined the retreat for the morning session to help do some strategic thinking. There's, all, there's really no limits on the way that retreat time can be designed and used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, who's in the room? What do we need to work on? And then comes the fun part of, okay, and how could we you know, create a day that has the dynamics um, that will make it that make it fun and, and interesting as well as productive, right? So when people leave at the end, they go, "Wow, that was that was really great." Um, our intent is to have a positive experience together that really moves us forward, and knowing that that could, you know, the shape and design of it could be um, quite variable. I noticed that co-ops put a lot of thought too into the setting for their retreats, sometimes going away for a day at buying an extra day of retreat time so that they can go away for a whole weekend. Um, that's not a common thing, but I think it's very impactful when it's successful. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and similarly, um, uh, I have a co-op that's been terrific for a number of years where we do a retreat every six months. And what I like about that is um, at the end of the retreat, you can foreshadow the next six months and really have a sense that we're comfortable and confident that people are well oriented, well prepared to go through that amount of time. And then you get to do that again six months later. I'm just tying it back to creative ways to use hours, right? I've done, you know, six month check ins, you know, two hour short uh, uh -huh. board meeting forums where we've tried to accomplish the same thing, provide continuity for bringing the work that was planned in the retreat forward into the year. Really good, yeah, I'm not sure that in the hours part we we uh, created that picture of us, you know, Skyping in or telecommuting in to a group. Um, you know, that can be effective and hopefully will become, you know, even more of a normal thing over time, that'd be fun. Um, you know, the purpose of, co the purpose of food co-ops now is really, you know, kind of up in the air. Um, if you can get natural foods everywhere, uh, what's making the co-op, um, uh, you know, critical? And why why do people want to belong to it? And what's the execution have to look like uh, in terms of, you know, running great grocery stores and all that stuff? There's a lot of learning um, from, from my perspective uh, on the social trends, the business trends, the competitive environment, which are all kind of external things, as well as um, current thinking um, at management level and at the staff level of how to really be uh, amazing. Because I think if we're going to thrive, we have to really uh, nail that stuff. And and we wouldn't just want to assume that the people on the board know those things 
you know, just naturally it's, 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 that would, I think be a misstep. So, so right there is a huge amount of, um, potential content and, uh, potentially interesting, uh, you know, fodder for retreat design as well. Well, and Mark, the next, you know, the add on to that, right, is there's really nobody other than the board that will sit down for an hour in the middle of the week and listen to a couple of consultants talk about how to grow and develop their board, right, or the thinking mm -hmm. behind that. And by the same token, if we're going to figure out really for each community, what is the unique value and the unique difference that that co-op is mm -hmm. going to make in the community, it's really got to be the board who's going to sit down there, not just learn all the things that you're describing, but then take what they already know and the connections they have with the community to manifest that in some right. way that's going to make it real. That's right. Community. Yep. Good. The wrap up on the retreat. And I think it relates to the use of ongoing hours as well would be really reflect on what's our pattern of retreat planning. Are we having a strategic conversation um, with the Seabill consultant, with the board, to surface a range of ideas and approaches um, so that we can really go into it going, oh, we're really on the right stuff or, you know, reasonable, great stuff. And take the opportunity to grow ourselves, both as consultants and as cooperators together, right? Yeah, right. That's one of the most powerful things that's going on throughout all of these relationships. Mm -hmm. One of the cool things about retreats we didn't mention, Mark, but I think um, a number of clients have, have reflected, especially when I pick up clients uh, from a, another consultant and we have a conversation about, you know, what did you learn? Uh, we're actually able to teach a whole lot of things by the way we design and plan the retreat that can translate pretty powerfully into the execution of board meetings. Just simple basics of facilitation, mm -hmm. training, and meeting planning. Yep. Um, just the process of planning and, and conducting the retreat can be really helpful that way. Yep, good. Um, another dimension is that we have a pretty great resource library and um, lots of co-op cafe videos that are useful to play in retreats to help stimulate a conversation. Um, those are also available to play in board meetings and, and whatnot. And, and I think that, again, it's that connection of us being in the work with you, on the phone with you, and going, oh, yeah, here's a thing that's like eight minutes that you could drop into your next board meeting and really queue up that conversation. Or, um, hey, for the next retreat, why don't we have everyone watch this video together, and then we can jumpstart the conversation because we have that shared experience. Um, and again, we're, I mean, that, I think those are both examples of kind of strategic um, uh, uses of strategic content in our library. Similarly, we have, you know, tons of nuts and bolts stuff that we would be bringing to both, you know, a phone call and, um, you know, a retreat if you're working on, are we thinking strategically about, you know, GM compensation or um, what are the new trends in um, qualifying and electing directors? Those kinds of things, um, you know, are the stuff that we're continually gathering and and producing so that so again that bringing the resources outside resources to the design question of what could happen in the meeting and what can happen in the retreat um, next week we're going to um, take some time to talk about uh, our in-person events and also the some some new um, some new work that we're developing uh, for next year where we've identified uh, four themes and, um, and we're gonna provide some online learning opportunities, some online storytelling uh, organized around um, electing and qualifying directors, um, uh, competing in the marketplace to thrive, which will be um, uh, say board, uh, not just board, but really education, top level education on trends and issues in the marketplace. Um, the board having a really strong board gym relationship going to really come at that in many different ways. And then finally, the, um, the co-op cafe theme is co-op participation and co-op impact. And we're going to be uh, gathering stories about co-op impact and how they're really derived from choices and actions of many, many, uh, many people involved in our, in our co-ops. Um, so, 
on that fourth thing, the co-op impact, co-op participation, more, uh, in addition to having the in-person co-op cafe, we're going to try and uh, keep that alive during the year uh, with, um, with some online content. And um, these four events will be using this format. And, um, and then we've, we've, we've got our R&D caps on, and we're working on uh, the format for uh, uh, delivering um, on these four themes. And we'll keep you posted on that. But we are excited about potentially reaching uh, many more people uh, by really focusing on the online uh, method and also saving uh, time and, and money for people in terms of uh, maybe not needing to go to one more meeting if we can uh, create an effective delivery system using the internet. So that's coming up. Um, Thane, other things we should mention in our closeout? No, I think just to appreciate everybody who was on the call because it was fun to see the registration list and know that I could say hello in person to yeah. you know, folks that we work closely with and who have supported the program for a lot of years. And actually, Really created good. it with us, right? We haven't created this program in a vacuum, actually. It's grown right. up in our collective experience with our clients, which are now, what, 120-something clients, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. Thanks for being in that work with us, and thank you, Joel Brock, for doing our technology, and Joel Kapitschke and Ben Sandel for sitting in with us, and um, if you have any questions about anything that came up uh, today, just feel free to email um, myself, Thane, uh, in your CBuild person, um, info at CDS Consulting Co-op. I mean, uh, we aren't that hard to find. So I look forward to that conversation if there's one to be had. Okay. Thank you.